was a boyfriend that I was with. I remember we checked in and we went into the hotel room and I hadn't been feeling well. So I went and laid down and there had been abuse that had been leading up to this, but never quite at this magnitude. And when he walked in, uh, he walked over to me on the bed and sat on top of me and lifted his hand and as far back as he could and backhanded me. And I just remember laying there completely shocked, wondering what had just happened and why. I mean, it was pretty much every possible way of hitting me that could happen. Um, throwing me, hitting me, um, body slamming me on the floor. And I remember the whole night thinking, you can hit me and you can do what you want to me. I will walk out of here or at least leave here alive. I'm not leaving in a body bag. He had completely damaged the room with my body. He had ripped the phone out of the wall to the point where he actually ripped the wall out with it so that I couldn't call anybody. And he got on top of me and straddled me, pinning my arms down to my side. And he said to me, and remember he bent down and whispered into my right ear, I'm going to kill you now. So go ahead and think your last thoughts. And I remember at that point thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna leave here in a body bag. And my family is going to get a phone call that I died in a hotel room at the hands of somebody who is supposed to be protecting me. And he started choking me, strangling me. Um, and I remember his hands wrapping around my throat so tight that I swear I felt like it was gonna pop my head off. And I remember thinking, I have absolutely no control. And so grasping for what little control I could have, my only control was, I don't have to look at you when I die. So I remember with his hands around me kind of turning to the left while he's still on top of me so that I didn't have to see him and that he didn't end up being the last thing that I looked at when I died. And I remember laying there, everything starting to go black and my whole body just in excruciating pain. And I remember thinking, I hope my family knows that I, that I love them. And that that they get some kind of closure that I didn't suffer, even though I was. I, I didn't want them to ever, ever think that my last moments were in, were in suffering. So while he was on top of me, strangling me, all of a sudden I could see it and I could feel it and it was this incredible light and it was gold and it was bright went shot through the top of my head and through my entire body out my feet and he went flying across the room and it hit the wall and there was no way I could have pushed him off of me I could hardly move and I remember it stunned him for a minute he had no idea what just happened and I got up off the bed you know, gasping for air. And he just had this look on his face, like what the hell just happened? And I got up and I crawled across the room and he got up and he walked over to me and got right in my face. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know how you just did that. It won't happen again. And he said, I'm going to go have a cigarette and I'm going to come back and finish you off. And it will happen this time. And I remember laying there and all of a sudden I had my cell phone in my hand. I don't know how I got it. I don't remember at all. And I remember being absolutely terrified that he was going to get back into the room and finish strangling me and kill me this time. And I called my parents. I ended up being left in the hotel room. I swear what felt like 10 hours, but it had to have been about an hour and a half. Well, when my dad called back for probably about the third time, the police department, the dispatcher said to him, 
oh, we thought it was just a drunken public. We picked him up a while ago. I remember hearing that and absolutely just almost collapsed. It was just this absolute sense of nobody cared. And I was alone. I was literally relying on the police to get there and they weren't coming. And I finally remember feeling like I was in a prison. So I finally hear a knock on the door and it's a police officer, one police officer. And he shows up and I remember like it was yesterday. He walked into the room and he said, oh my God, looking around the room. And he goes, this is what happened. And he looked at me and he said, he strangled you, didn't he? And I just remember looking at him saying, how did you know that? And he, he kind of, you know, touched my neck and he, he said, look. And I remember he walked me over to the mirror of the bathroom wall and he, he said, look, and he pointed at my neck and he had strangled me so badly and so hard that this was actually indentions in my neck from his fingers to the point where the police officer and myself could take our fingers and actually put them in my neck. The EMTs came in the room and they basically reacted the same way that the police officer did. And I remember sitting there and they asked me questions and they said to me, we need to take you to the hospital. And I was so frustrated by this point and tired and scared. And I knew I was hurting. I knew my body was in really bad shape, but I was in such shock. I wasn't really feeling it. And I just remember saying to them, I just want to go home. I, I just want to go home. I don't want to be in this room anymore. Get me out of this room. Get me out of this room. And they, they said, okay, you could tell just by the room alone and my outer appearance that I was not in my body. I was not there. And I remember actually saying, no, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And I remember a part of me saying, don't listen to me, just take me to the hospital. And I, I couldn't get it out. And they ended up telling me, okay, we'll leave you. And they left. They tried to prosecute him. I remember the prosecutor called me and it wasn't a stubborn thing. It wasn't a defiant thing. It was a, you left me. All of you down there left me. And when the prosecutor had said, this is what we're charging him with, we need you to come down and testify, I said no. And I basically said, why should I? You guys don't do anything anyway. What's it gonna do? And she said, well, it'll do a lot. And I said, really? Because I said, I remember being left in a hotel room for dead and being told we thought it was a drunken public. So what are you gonna do for me if I come down and actually testify? It's been what, 13 years now since this happened? And I, I can think about the assault and feel some closure from that. I do feel like I have been able to grow and learn from it and become bigger than the assault. What haunts me to this day is how I was left and completely just abandoned by the professionals that are supposed to be there to help you. Like I said, it wasn't that they did it, you know, on purpose or to do it personally towards me. It was a lack of communication. It was a lack of the system not having the understanding of how to work with somebody that just went through something like this. And so part of it for me now is feeling like I have this permanent scar of feeling like that was never concluded for me. 
in that way. I should have been able to have somebody that could stand by me that understood that I wasn't in my body and to be able to speak for me and be an advocate for me. Even that police officer should have been my advocate at that moment or the EMTs should have been my advocate at that moment. And if they had been properly taught what to do for somebody in this situation, it would have been done differently. And to this day, that's probably the portion of my torture and assault that haunts me the most. <laughs>